Welcome to the CodeCast Podcast. Real-world insights for your daily medical coding and billing processes. And now, here's your host, Terry Fletcher. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CodeCast Podcast. Today, my name is Terry Fletcher. So one of the things that I, I really like to comment on, especially towards the last um, part of the year, and we are coming up on that. So as we get into, you know, mid December, we're trying to plan for 2024. And what's the first thing that we need to really plan for? Well, in my opinion, it's a successful compliance program, not just a policy, not just a plan of what you hope to do, but really looking at a a compliance program and the infrastructure of that and what that looks like, because OIG put something out recently saying, look, we're finding that a lot of Medicare and Medicaid providers who have to, who are required to have a compliance program don't have one. And if we ask for it and there's not one there, you could possibly be banned from uh, that payer and being able to see those patients. So there's, you know, a broad spectrum, a spectrum of, you know, entities that play a role in healthcare delivery today. And you need to know what is part of that compliance program with all of the new codes that come out with uh, making sure you set your uh, staff up for success so they know what's expected of them. And when I say staff, I'm not just talking about your revenue cycle management staff. I'm talking about your front office, your back office, your physicians, your nurse practitioners, your PAs, you know, your clinical staff. Everyone needs to know how things work in your office and what is considered compliant through your policies that are built into a program. So the Office of Spencer, Expe- oh my gosh, I'm tug tied today. The Office of Inspector General, HHS Division, uh, they came out in November and updated their general compliance program guidance. So you can find that link either on my website, you can find it at oig.gov, but it's very helpful. And they give the seven elements of a successful compliance program. So the first one is written policies and procedures. And I'm glad that they put that first because that means you have to have a reference, a place to go to, something on white paper that says this is how we do things and here's the cited references as to why. Otherwise you have, especially uh, multi-physician groups, you have physicians and providers and staff even doing things that they think is okay or they think is this is the way to do it or they hope that they're getting things right but you you have to have a a, a road map if you will and that's with written policies and procedures that this is what we do and if you don't do it here are the consequences number two is compliance leadership and oversight so who's in charge of putting this together I recommend that it should be a staff member from each department, especially if you've got policies from each department, as you should, and then a physician, hopefully one that's the most compliant with documentation and coding and and all that in the office that you don't have to admonish too often. And they're the ones that, that are involved in oversight and making sure that it's correct and leading the team, if you will, the compliance team. Now, if you're a small practice where you have maybe one physician, one mid-level, you still have to have a compliance program. You have to be able to say, let's open our book and figure out where we are. And you have to update it regularly. You know, I, as you know, I, you know, I'm an educator, an auditor, biller, coder, whatever you want to call me as a consultant. I do an array of things, but it's amazing to me as an educator, how often I'm updating my information. So, you know, um, Medicare, for example, used to update their information back in the day, and I'm in my 40th year of healthcare. Oh my gosh, I'm old. (laughs) But back in the day, they used to update it about once a year, then it went to once every six months, then once a quarter. Now it's every day, every day. You know, we used, I used to have, you know, webinar companies and seminar companies that I spoke for. And now, of course, my own company in the last 20 years, where basically they said, you know, you have to have your PowerPoint or your educational materials into us a month before. I'm just like, now I'm like, you're crazy. I'll have it to you the day or two before, because what I said on Friday may not be correct on Monday. And so you have to make sure that you've got that you know, leadership and oversight that constantly understands that healthcare is an ever evolving situation. Number three is training and education. 
And that's a great way to lead into it in a segue. Not only do you have to have training and education, but I would strongly urge you to look outside your practice. If you don't have people that are equipped to train and educate, and when I say equipped, it's not just somebody who knows how to speak or knows how to, um, you know, present information. It's that do they have that right information? Do they have the current information? And do they have a way of presentation that they can reach your physicians, that they understand what it takes to, to get them to listen? And you really need to have the, the appropriate people in that training and education department. Number four is effective lines of communication with the compliance officer and disclosure program. So you have to be able to have that communicatory effort Um, with the compliance officer. And again, I think that should be a physician or at least an administrator with a clinical background and a disclosure program saying that this is what we do here, the consequences. And if we don't do it, a way to protect yourself, meaning that you probably also need to get legal counsel involved as well. Number five is enforcing standards. So consequences, consequences and incentives. Now you have to be careful with Stark too on incentivizing people to do their job. But consequences in not doing your job has to be part of a compliance program. It has to be. Otherwise, why have it? You have to be able to say, here's the roadmap. Here's what we're doing. Here's what is published guidance. And I hate to always say legally because I'm not an attorney and I don't play one on TV, but I am a compliance person, you know, professional. And I do understand what the rules and regulatory guidance tells us that we have to do, what the requirements are for certain things. And if you have a provider that's not doing it, what's the consequences for that provider, for that staff member even? So it's not just always on the provider, the physicians, it's also on staff that are, could be clinical, could be administrative, um, could be in the central billing office, but there's always consequences to actions, especially if you're not following a compliance program, which brings us back to if you're, if you don't have one, how can you have any consequences? Number six is risk assessment, auditing, and monitoring. You have to know what you possibly are doing that could expose you to risk. And I I see a lot of practices where, you know, I hate to use the the term, or should say two two, uh, word term, deliberate ignorance, but I've seen that where it's like, if you, you know, if I don't know, then it's not existing. That's, that's not true. And there's also something called invited risk. Um, There's a new code out there coming up. I mentioned it a couple of podcasts ago, G2211. That's going to be a nightmare for practices. The add-on, you know, complexity code that's really targeted for primary care. But I also see um, certain medicine specialties that are saying, oh, I want to do that. And then we've also got invited risk on, on telemedicine, where we have people, I'm still getting the question asked, well, we can call people and bill for a phone call for giving out test results, right? I'm like, no. No, you can't. And so auditing, you know, those phone calls, auditing things and, you know, finding out, are you doing that? Because somebody thought this would be cool or somebody said, um, well, and I always get this response. Well, they're doing it down the street. Oh, my gosh. And then monitoring, you know, are you making sure that you are not just checking once a month or checking uh, once a year? You're actually monitoring on a regular basis. I just had, uh, I get a call every once in a while, and I just had another one of a practice, and I was so appreciative of how they did things. They've got over um, a 1,000 physicians, and they're all audited with 10 charts every month. So that's an ongoing 1,000 charts a month, you know, approximately or more, that they're constantly looking at what they're doing. That is their risk assessment. They're auditing. They're monitoring on that. So they're, they've got that compliance program in place. Is it costly? It, it, it is, but how costly would it be to get in trouble? Talk about costly. And then number seven is responding to detected offenses and developing a corrective action initiative. So going back to number five, where it says enforcing standards, consequences, and incentives, you have to also have Number seven, which says responding to these detected uh, offenses where there was a problem and then developing corrective action initiatives. So what did you do to fix the problem? You know, it's not just the consequences, the fines, the, you know, ad, you know, the admonition to the, the provider who or staff who did something wrong, but how are you going to fix it moving forward and making sure that they do what they, they were supposed to do, what they were hired to do and what was part of your compliance program. 
The other thing is, is to keep in mind too, when number four, going back, effective lines of communication with the compliance offer, officer and a disclosure program. You need to have a box. You need to have something that there's no retaliation for somebody that wants to bring something up, you know, a risk area up to the administrator or to the compliance officer and say, this is what I'm seeing. Can you address it? And you, you can't retaliate against that person. You have to check it out. You have to make sure it's there. So just to recap the seven elements of a successful compliance program, written policies and procedures, compliance, leadership, and oversight, training and education, effective lines of communication with the compliance officer and disclosure program, enforcing standards, consequences, and incentives, risk assessment, auditing, and monitoring, and number seven, responding to detected offenses and developing a corrective action initiative. And if you look at that guidance from HHS OIG, it starts on page 32 and it goes down, I'm actually looking at it right now, and they give you tips too. That's really kind of nice how they look at how to manage it. They give you policy maintenance. They give you kind of tips of where you start, but it starts on page 32 and goes to, let me keep scrolling here. Boy, it really goes further. Um, it's a 91 page document, but it, uh, page 48, it looks like. So it's just, it's really important to pull this up if you can. If you need it, contact me. Happy to give you the link. But at hhs.gov, you can also Google it. And you're looking for the seven elements of a su successful compliance program, November 2023. And this will get you started. You know, it's it's also part of, you know, corporate integrity agreement agreements. It's an industry standard and it's really uh, lessons learned from what's happened with enforce enforcement actions and investigations. And now that we've got AI, oh my gosh, talk about a compliance policy you have to have there. So I strongly urge you as we are get, as we are in the last quarter, the last month of 2023, before you head into 2024, get your team together get a compliance program, at least start it with the seven elements that I've given you today. Really look at how you can improve your infrastructure, how you can um, get that white paper started. And if you need help with that, please contact us. We can engage in services and hopefully really assist you to get that as something in your office if you haven't done it um, already. So it's it's just something that you can't wait. You you can't wait to get this done. Um, you know, entities sometimes rely on screenings conducted by, you know, third party payers, or they think that billing companies are going to do that. But the OIG recommends that you validate what you're doing as well. They say, you know, you need to validate what the contractor is doing. Um, you, the entity is still responsible for overpayments, for any liabilities. You know, it doesn't matter what everyone else is doing. It's up to you to make sure that you are reviewing, you're revising, and you're updating your compliance plan and policies um, all the time because they, you have to also make sure that they reflect any modifications. Think of the pandemic. Think of things we were allowed to do during the PHE that we're not allowed to do anymore and making sure that that's updated. That's why the OIG came out with this in tw uh, November, because they said, okay, we've given you enough time since the pandemic ended in May. Now you really need to um, revamp and look at and tighten up your compliance programs and make sure that you're doing things uh, correctly. And they, you know, they, they can come in at any time and ask you for that. So you, you have to have not just a, a compliance program, but a compliance team, a compliance committee, um, you know, training and understand where you are uh, coming from, where, what are your cited references as you begin the discussion and the white paper information. And you really have to pay attention to the commission's guidelines because when federal courts get a hold of something that was done incorrectly, they say that we're now trying to determine criminal sentences and that, and I hate to go there. I really do. But I, I recently had a practice that had non, non QHPs and non 
physicians that were trying to bill office visits. And so I'm just like, oh my gosh, you've got to be kidding me. You know, they, they hired some registered dietitians and some, um, you know, counselors. And I'm just like, okay, well, they can't bill office visits. And if they bill medical nutritional therapy, let's talk about the RDs for a second. It's for chronic kidney disease or it's for diabetic patients. It's You can't bill office visits. And I said, they don't have medical decision making um, and can bill independently. And they're like, oh, no, they're just billing under the physician. I'm like, no, they can't do that. They're clinical staff. They're not QHPs. And they got in trouble. And that's how I, I, I pulled it up. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, what are you doing? And so when you basically hire some new people and you just don't um, do your due diligence first to make sure that before you do anything, um, you know what the rules are, you can get in so much trouble. The other thing, the OIG believes that whistleblowers are should be protected against retaliation. And that's what I talked about. You need to have some kind of a, a way that somebody can write um, up a concern confidentially without any retaliation. And all employees are encouraged this communication with the compliance officer um, for any potential fraud. They're also trying to help you, but also they're trying to protect themselves. And you have to appreciate that. And so that communication is important. It can be done through a hotline you set up, a website, an email address, or a mailbox. But they, you have to be able to, the, those communications have to be protected. And so just hopefully you're, you're seeing what I'm talking about here. This is going to give you some food for thought as we head into 2024. And you will uh, really take heed to get those compliance programs together. The CodeCast podcast is also brought to you today by Decision Health Select Coder. Get all of the decision-making information you need to code in a single online resource. Select Coder offers you the comprehensive coding guidance required to code accurate claims the first time. Try Select Coder for free. Sign up at decisionhealth.com forward slash SC free trial. So my coding question today actually is in the cardiology field. Um, somebody was asking me, okay, so I'm doing lower extremity. So it's kind of interventional radiology carve out for cardiology, peripheral, we call it. Um, I'm doing lower extremity interventions and I'm doing a stent in the right femoral uh, artery. Can I also bill for a catheter placement? The answer is no. And you can only bill for the imaging, the radiology code in addition to that, if it's what we call diagnostic, very similar concept to what we do for coronary. But the reason you cannot bill for the catheter placement, in some peripheral, some non-coronary you can, but for lower extremity you can't, is because on page 311 of the Professional Edition 2023 CPT book, second paragraph on the right, it says these lower extremity endovascular revascularization codes, that's the interventions, all include the work of accessing and selectively catheterizing the vessel. So that's the catheter placement, whether you stick it in or move it. Transversing the lesion, that's the wire placement. The radiological supervision interpretation directly related to the intervention. So if you're trying to check your work or you're just doing setup angiography, you can't code for that. Uh, embolic protection if used. And then the closure of the site. So it's pretty clear in there when it says that it includes accessing and catheterizing the vessel. Now, to expand that further, if you were doing, let's say, oh, let's pick one. Let's say you were doing an angioplasty only of a pulmonary artery, 37246, or the aorta. Now that one, if you look at the information above that, that one says you actually can code for selective or non-selective cath. So built into the RVU is not part of, is not the catheterization of that vessel. So you can code for those services. So know the location before you go into coding or overcoding incorrectly on non-coronary before you um, decide, well, I can code it for everything. It's very clear within the CPT book if you can or cannot code for it. Okay, so a little personal tidbit about me. Oh, my Steelers are on a two-game losing streak. Two teams that are 2-10, and ten, I'm going to lose my mind. And the last game on Thursday night was just ridiculous. So you got two yards to get a first down. And what do you do with a terrible backup quarterback because our quarterback is injured? You throw it down the field trying to get a flag. There's no way that was going to work. And, you were, and it was on fourth down, so... I'm kind of losing my mind there. I'm, I'm not sad about it. I'm angry about it. So hopefully, hopefully in 10 days, 
we have a, a better time of it. We have to play next Saturday against Indy, but I'm not confident right now. So it doesn't look like our season's going to get better. We had a chance to win two games and get to um, nine and four, and instead we're seven and six. So um, yeah, I'm having a I'm having a rough day, rough week. Oh my goodness, my sports teams. But hopefully yours is doing better. I know my good friend Sean Weiss is excited for his Miami Dolphins. And I know my other good friend, uh, Sean, from the wine club I belong to, and we are in a football fantasy in that in that club. Um, his Patriots beat my, my Steelers, so I can't believe it. Yeah, I need to stop having friends named Sean. They're, they're bugging me. Anyway, everyone, have a great rest of your uh, day and your week, and hopefully you're getting some Christmas or Hanukkah shopping done. So thank you for listening to the CodeCast podcast. For more information on medical coding, billing, auditing, and compliance, including how to hire Terry, follow Terry on Twitter at TerryCoder1 or visit her website at www.terryfletcher.net. Podcast producer Joe Kuzma, music producer Assassin Music. <laughs>